Now to today's presentation. Sarah Luke is a teacher and historian. Her first book, Callan Park, Hospital for the Insane, was shortlisted for the 2019 New South Wales Premier's History Award, Community and Regional History Prize. Her second book, Like a Wicked Noah's Ark, The Nautical School Ships Vernon and Sobrayan, was published in 2020. Sarah will discuss her research into the nautical school ships today, Vernon and Sobrayan, which were moored at Cockatoo Island for several decades from the 1870s onwards. Filled up for the reception of neglected and delinquent boys, these ships were New South Wales' first public industrial schools. With a wholesome curriculum of academic work, trade training and sport, they sought to rescue the rising criminal generations from further degradation. Sarah will explore the daily workings of the ships along with some of their most interesting alumni. And now I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, hello everyone, thank you for coming. I'm glad, this is distracting, but people in the room, you'll, you'll get used to it. I'll try not to stare at myself for the whole time. <laughs> um, thank you, Catherine, for that lovely introduction. Um, so we're going to talk about the Vernon and Sabron, um, uh, an interesting topic. I think one that also polarizes people. Um, this is the Sabron, um, sorry, the Vernon, help if the person um, speaking could get that right. This is the Vernon, a great picture, but I think one that's also interesting because so many people look at this picture and think wow this ship was a prison a juvenile prison and therefore a more scary prison than adult prisons um it looks like one absolutely it looks scary it looks dark um it confused people in the 19th century, just like it confuses people today. I meet lots of people at presentations like this, um, even people who email me through my website to let me know that they are very concerned that this was a prison ship for children and it actually wasn't. Um, absolutely, there are some famous alumni from this institution who were criminals and they did horrendous things. Um, here are some of them. Um, <laughs> Um, this is John Slay. He was a bushranger. He stole people's horses. He robbed people. He killed people. Um, he forced them to do horrible things at gunpoint. And yes, he was a Vernon boy. Um, one of my favourites, only because I think he looks like someone from One Direction. Um, this, is, this is William Rice. Um, one day he had a brain snap in the middle of Sydney um, and pulled a pistol out of his pocket and shot the man he was standing with because it suddenly occurred to him that the man he was standing with might possibly um, have his eye on William's girlfriend, um, who's a famous prostitute, complex. Um, so William Rice was hanged at Darlinghurst Jail for that murder. And yes, he was a Vernon boy. Um, another one, Tommy Cox. Um, Tommy Cox liked attacking people, um, children, um, he wasn't above that. Um, he was a gang leader for many years in Marrickville. Um, uh, he attacked his mother, he beat her up. Um, he liked to attack uh, people walking through parks, um, people out shopping, you name it. Um, another really wholesome Vernon, Vernon boy. Um, so this ship absolutely had some criminals coming through uh, their ranks and, and who were enrolled there, but the, not all the boys were criminals. They hadn't necessarily done anything wrong, which meant that they would be admitted to this nautical school ship, um, and, but some of them did turn out badly. Now, part of this confusion rests in some seemingly really boring legislation from the time. In 1866 in Sydney, a lot of, um, they tended to be middle class, uh, people would be walking around Sydney Harbour, looking around and they couldn't help but notice that there were lots of children who weren't in school, who weren't doing the right thing. Um, and some legislation in 1866 was created by Henry Parks um, two different arms of legislation. The first piece was um, an act that established uh, industrial schools. So these were schools that would take children, boys and girls, they would educate them, 
we have to remember that education was not um, enforced. It, it wasn't something that every, child, every child was necessarily doing as part of their everyday life they are today. Um, and then these children, boys and girls, would be taught a trade. The other piece of legislation that was being created at exactly the same time, the, the twin to the Industrial Schools Act, was an act to establish juvenile reformatories. Juvenile reformatories are the places, are the places where children who had committed serious crimes would go. Now, these two pieces of twin legislation being brought up at the same time, being put into action at the same time, created a lot of confusion, particularly where the Vernon was concerned. If we go back, it definitely looks like a prison. When we look at a ship like this, we think convict hulk, we think really horrible naval style discipline, unbending um, rules, things like that. In 1866, with this legislation, it created this confusion from the beginning. Um, in uh, the nautical school ship, so we had the Vernon first from 1867 to 1892. In 1892 up to 1911, the ship was a different ship. It was the Sabron. And this up on the screen is a certificate the boys would receive when they left the Sabron. It was an identical one made for Vernon boys. But this one is interesting. It tells us a lot about this tension between these two pieces of legislation because it says very clearly that this ship was established as an industrial school, not a reformatory in the year 1867. This was a problem, a PR problem, and a problem that the boys responded to all of the time. Some boys, when they were brought on deck for the first time on the Vernon, were shaking, saying, no, 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 I didn't do anything. I was just truanting from school. I was sleeping rough. What are you bringing me here to this prison for? Well, the answer was, it wasn't a prison. Now, these are some of our lovely Vernon boys, Vernon and Sabron boys. Um, I think the one on the right, I've seen that expression in children <laughs> today. <laughs> nice synergy through the ages. Um, uh, so here are some generic children. Um, the Industrial Schools Act was a really interesting piece of legislation because it moved children from the streets onto these nautical school ships really swiftly for a number of very minute reasons. This would be kind of scary if you were a kid in a gang because the pol police can get you now. The Industrial Schools Act required that a child who being arrested appear to be under 16 um, uh, for a very range of very specific offences. So the first one was merely wandering about. Sydney. This was now a crime if you look to be under 16 years old. The boys on the screen were all picked up for these reasons. So wandering about, being in company of reputed thieves that the local police force would know about, living with people who had no visible means of support, so living with criminals, even if they were petty criminals, living with prostitutes was a crime if you were a child who looked under 16 years old, even if those parents uh, even if the prostitutes were your parents, it was still a crime. Um, other crimes were things like having no visible means of support. Begging was also a crime for children. It would get you on these industrial school ships. Loitering, being without any sort of occupation or a lawful occupation, or just sleeping rough. Um, a lot of boys were picked up for criminal activity, minor crimes, things like stealing from shops was a big one. And what would happen in the court would be that they would be charged for that petty crime. They would be imprisoned until the rising of the court. And then at the end of the day, the boy would be brought up again under the Industrial Schools Act and transferred to the Vernon or Sabron because of the Industrial Schools Act crimes, not because they'd just stolen an orange from Mr. Smith's shop on King Street. Um, so criminal activity, even if these boys had engaged in minor criminal activity, it was never the reason that they were brought onto the ship. Now, occasionally magistrates got this really wrong. They didn't understand. Surprisingly, this happened quite often and they would sentence boys to six months on the Vernon. That wasn't the thing. So children have to be taken back to court 
um, go through the whole legal process again. The idea was for all children brought on board that from the day that you were brought on board, you stayed on board the ship for about a year or a year and a half, and then you were apprenticed out somewhere in New South Wales until you turned 18. So if you were at the younger end of the spectrum there and the youngest age was seven that you could be brought on board the Swan or the Vernon, you spent a year, a year and a half on board, you could have a decade ahead of you out on apprenticeship, which is a very long time for a little kid, particularly when you're working on a farm or something like that. You know, two minutes ago you were hanging around the slums of Sydney and now suddenly you're milking cows at 6 a.m. on a farm somewhere. Um, now, the boys under the Industrial Schools Act were all sent to the Vernon and the girls were sent to a school just for girls. Initially that school was in Newcastle, um, but the accommodation was horrendous. They got upgraded to the equally horrible convict barracks up on Cockatoo Island where we are right now. Um, I think that would be a great place to go and visit after this presentation. If you have the time, you can stand there and pretend that you're a um, homeless girl who's been brought there. Maybe envisage the ship down on the water and think about the funding discrepancies um, that you were enjoying. Um, eventually, though, the girls were moved out to Parramatta um, and the boys remained here for several more um, decades. So the aim of these institutions was to stop this cycle, this generational cycle of poverty leading to crime. Um, it was an opportunity for children, instead of being just plonked in Darlinghurst jail, where they could make criminal associations, join gangs with the gang leaders who had already been incarcerated there, they were, the, the cycle was stopped, the circuit was broken, so that these boys instead would go to a purpose-built institution out in the Vernon uh, so that they couldn't consort with these already very established criminals. I think a fascinating institution. I think this, this sounds like great fun in some respects and then not so fun in others, which you're probably thinking right now, what would this be like for me? I thought what I would speak about now is about the daily life that these children enjoyed. Um, a big part of these boys lives was being forced to go to school each day. Um, there was nothing at this time in the 1860s in Sydney to compel a child to go to school. A lot of them did go to school, but the school rates, attendance rates jumped up and down. But if you were a Vernon or a Sabron boy, you would be in class. Um, there are some wonderful pictures from the early ship um, of this education happening. I'm fairly certain that this is a staged photograph um, for some of the government photographers who came on board the Vernon um, in the really early 1870s. The reason I think this um, is because the boys' classroom was not out on deck. Um, it was down um, in one of the other spaces below decks, but I suppose this is maybe better for lighting. Um, the teacher's blackboard, you can zoom into this picture, it's amazing quality, um, and it ironically says photography in lovely cursive writing. I think that's a little nod to what was really going on. Um, you can see next to the teacher, the teachers didn't have to wear their naval uniform. They were the only staff at, at that level of the hierarchy that wore their normal Normal clothes. Um, you can see he has an amazing abacus next to him. Um, the boys in this picture, and which is absolutely uh, it tallies with what was happening in reality, the boys are divided into different classes. You can see that some of them are writing with ink and some of them are writing on slates. Um, the younger ones tended to write on slates and the elder on ink, uh, in ink. Um, a lot of the boys, I think we have to remember, when they arrived on board this ship, some of them had never been to school before. So you'd have 15-year-olds who didn't know the alphabet. But by the same token, sometimes you'd have 10-year-olds who had been to school for whatever reason, um, and they were actually quite able to be studying things like geography, particularly Australia's geography, and other more complex mathematical and grammatical lessons. So it was a bit of a, a mixture. I think that 
as a teacher myself, sometimes we think that differentiation in our classrooms is something that only happens these days. But these teachers on board um, this ship were very, very good at differentiating their curriculum. They followed the New South Wales curriculum um, for their students. There's a lot of evidence through the teachers weekly reports to the superintendent about who's moving up classes, who needs more support and is moving down classes. I think that's a, a great image. Um, we also have this one from many, many, many years later, um, nearing the end of the Sabron's time. Um, and this is a real classroom this time. Um, so we're not faking this one. Um, by about the 1890s, um, once the Suborn had come into effect from 1892, there were three teachers on board rather than just the one that the Vernon had had for a very long time. Um, and you can see it, the classrooms are quite amazing. Um, they have pictures on the walls. Um, they've got interesting things on the table in the centre. Um, this was a, a big part of the boys' education, having a, a museum on board um, where they exchanged artefacts with the Technical College in Ultimo. Um, they had lots of different coins, shells. Sometimes people donated things like minerals, um, different artefacts, all kinds of things. And then they would be brought to class um, and then also filled the museum that was in the library on board. Um, you can actually also see a, a world globe just behind the blackboard um, that this time says NSS Sabron. Um, and you can see that the teachers are apparently pretending to do a lesson. I do like this child in the second row though. There's always one who looks at the camera. Again, I've seen that before. Um, James McAvoy, who was the first um, boy apprentice from the Vernon, um, he had been very well educated. Um, he was one of the first children who arrived in the first week. Um, and when he was there, there were only about 20 other children. Um, he had been educated so well um, and won awards on board the ship that he had extra lessons from with the small group of so quite able and had extra lessons on navigation and compass points and things like that. So you, you get quite a broad range of what these children were capable of and what they needed. That before and after was a really key part of the Vernon and Sabron sense of success. Um, the, the school had these massive entrance books, these really large bound volumes. And a lot of the information on those pages is just notes by the captain and other staff. But there's a little section for each double page spread where the boys are asked to write their name on their arrival and then exit from the ship. And some of the, the contrasts are beautiful, you know, this sort of really raggedy handwriting and this beautiful copper plate writing after a year and a half. Not to say everyone had that kind of transformation, um, but definitely a, a change occurred through that sense of education on board. Um, the teachers were, some of them lived on the ship. Um, so it's sort of like a boarding school. I think some teachers here today would think, oh, good gracious, no, left me back on land. Um, uh, but they also organised um, some of the recreation in the evenings. They manned the library as well and were responsible for cataloguing the books. Um, Darlinghurst jail prisoners bound um, newspapers and other periodicals and the teachers would be responsible for encouraging the boys to read. I think um, this is a, a nice time to mention James Carroll. Um, this, were, this photo was taken um, the moment that he arrived on board the ship. There was a, a phase in the 1890s where the school had a camera um, and they, I can see the thought process, what shall we use this camera for? We will photograph the new boys. And there's this lovely but very short series of photographs um, of some of the new recruits. And this is James Carroll who, um, actually trekked quite a long way um, through bushland. Um, and then when he arrived in Sydney, um, asked if he could please go onto the Vernon um, and be educated. Um, and he uh, made the newspaper for his good results at school. He was in the lower first class. That's pretty good. Um, his picture was actually published in the newspaper. And this, I've got to say, very strange journalist interviewed him with some 
really bizarre questions. Um, but that's James Carroll. I do like that they let him bring his things. You'd think someone would say, hey, James, you can put that down now for the photo. But no, they, they took it all. Um, the boys also, as part, um, thanks to their teachers, also did life-saving classes. Um, I love this photo because I've done this. Um, the boys in the, the row, the um, second row, all have different kinds of slings on their arms. I too have done this. Um, I might even know how to make them. Um, uh, and you've got the posters of anatomy in the background and these two children at the front hanging it up on stretches. Um, so different things happening on board the ship that were part, was part of the boys' education. I think that their curriculum was really interesting, uh, a lovely mixture of academic work, um, but also things like uh, they made a lot of things in their manual training classes. Um, they did a lot of something called sloyd paperwork, where you would cut and fold paper into different shapes, and it was an opportunity for your manual dexterity to be extended a little bit. And then you also had these um, first aid classes. They also did life-saving competitions and some of the competitions that are still happening today, the Sabron and Vernon boys um, were some of the first winners of those um, and their names are still on the cups, which is lovely. Um, but school wasn't the only thing that these boys were doing um, each day. Um, certainly school was a, a big part of uh, the process on board, um, but trade training was also really important. We have to remember that these ships were designed to wrench these children out of poverty and often criminality, but to do that so that they don't slide back into those ways, there also has to be an education in terms of what their future jobs might be. Um, and what this meant was trade training during the day. Now, Captain Maine, the first captain, who looks like a salty sea dog, if ever there was one, um, he didn't do this very well. Um, Maine saw the role of trade training as eclipsing these boys' lives. There was almost no room in their schedule for anything else in the first few years because trade training had to happen. So he had children shoemaking. He had them being carpenters. Some of them, the very best ones, like James McAvoy, for instance, who was having navigational lessons in his spare time, he was being trained as a sailor. But there were also children uh, learning to be bakers and tailors. Gardening on Cockatoo Island also was something that they spent a lot of time doing. But it got to this fever pitch where Captain Maine is sitting back thinking, oh, this is all going very well. But the children had no time to do anything else. Co-curricular activity overload. Um, now, what happened when Captain Maine died, um, in some ways suddenly and in some ways not, um, the new captain, Captain Nightenstein, um, he's on the left, um, and Nightenstein's uh, successor, Captain Mason, much easier to say, we'll focus on Mason, you have to have a bit of a run up uh, to Nightenstein. Um, they both had a very similar sense that these boys needed time on board the ship um, uh, for lots of things beyond just trades. So they both reduced the amount of hours each day that the boys were training in these trades and instead focused that training on things that would actually be useful for the ship. So for instance, since instead of just making stuff as carpenters, um, Nathanstein and Mason would have the boys making things particularly for use in the ship. Um, instead of just baking random things, some of the boys would help in the kitchen. So it was much more targeted. It also, I think, um, and Nathanstein was very good at this, it gave the boys, I think, a much stronger sense of the institution um, as something that they owned and that they were responsible for. Um, I think that we see this um, in lots of instances on these ships, but if you made it, then no one breaks it. Um, it you know, if you've organised something, then everyone follows the rules. Um, and when you're dealing with hundreds of boys on a ship out in the middle of Sydney Harbour, it's very public. You want everyone to be following the rules. Um, Nightenstein's philosophy was that boys will learn a lot of these trades when they're out on apprenticeship in New South Wales. You know, if you've been apprenticed as a dairy farmer, um, you're probably going to be taught to be a dairy farmer. 
Um, if you are apprentice as a general servant, then you're going to get experience in a whole range of different areas. Why are we bothering to teach these extraneous things on board the ship when it's not really necessary? Isn't this what the masters of apprenticeship will do? Instead, what Knight and Spain and Mason really wanted to do through these smaller chores was to teach the boys things like respectful behaviour, being honest. A lot of these boys come from the streets. When someone asks them a question, someone in authority, they're programmed to lie um, or to at least obscure the facts. So a lot of these jobs that the boys were doing, a lot of their chores were designed to teach them to be good, obedient human beings, um, to follow instructions from adults and particularly people in command. I think the best bit, though, of being near Cockatoo Island um, and probably the jewel in Knight and Stain's crown was that a big part of the days, uh, the boys, daily lives were involved having fun. Recreation was timetabled each day, which sounds kind of harsh and annoying, but I think it's important to book that time. So the recreation that the boys um, were allowed to do, some ship-based activities, one of them was skylarking, so just messing around with each other, which is an always popular pastime in my experience. You could also be reading in the library. If you couldn't read, then some of the older boys quite liked reading to the younger boys, which I think adds a really nice sense of community. Um, a lot of the boys really liked craft, so an extension of their manual training lessons in their academic hours at school and beading was a um, massively popular pastime, making coasters and runners and spelling out people's names, sending them in the post to people. Um, when you're out on apprenticeship, writing into the captain, dear captain, I'm having a lovely time. Um, I'm milking cows every morning at 5 a.m. Could you please send me some ruby red beads because I need to finish my coaster. Um, uh, so lots of craft happening, but the really big draw card for the Vernon and Sabron being is so close to Cockatoo Island was the boys could play on Cockatoo Island. Now, for the people here, I'm just going to move this across. This is a brilliant photo. There's so much going on in it. We have the Sabron at the time. So Sabron was three times bigger than the Vernon. And you could expect about 150 children for the daily average on board. Um, on Cockatoo Island over here, on the far left, we've got uh, the swimming pool. The boys were all taught to swim, uh, which is handy on a ship. Um, before we started today, I was speaking to um, one of the audience members here um, and we were talking about how many boys accidentally fell off the ship, um, occasionally hitting their head um, and their friends were diving in after them and effectively saved their lives. So swimming was really crucial if you were out on the harbour. Um, a lot of swimming occur, uh, swimming lessons occurred in this pool. We'll talk maybe a bit later if we have time about one of the famous swimmers on board the Sabron. On um, the grass next to the swimming pool is a really complex area. You can see it's fenced off for Sabron boys only. We have um, some areas for gymnastics. The gymnastics club was incredibly popular um, uh, for many, many years uh, at Cockatoo Island. You had to be very well behaved to be allowed membership in these clubs. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, there was a gymnastics area just near the shed closest to us. Um, you can see along the fence um, that there was a space for a pet shed. The boys, if they were particularly well behaved, were allowed to own a pet, so like rabbits and birds, guinea pigs, things like that. They had some um, uh, pets that all the boys owned. They had an emu, which had been gifted to them. They had a few dogs um, and a lot of pot plants for, I suppose, the, the, the less fond of animals children. Um, uh, this ground is also used for cricket. Um, and just general games. Rounders was occasionally played here as well. Um, sometimes on Cockatoo Island, the um, girls who were up on the um, very top of the island in the convict barracks um, they found the boys playing and exercising here quite distracting. Um, uh, and the superintendent up there used to write these nasty letters to the captain saying, could you please not be on the island? Um, 
stay on the ship all of the time. I'm not sure what the, the solution was. Um, this is a, a nice close-up picture of the boys playing cricket in the foreground um, and then also doing their gymnastics in the background. You can see some of the staff are helping out with that. Um, I'm not a gymnast, but I feel that this is quite advanced. <laughs> um, you've also got um, Mrs. Nightingale and her daughter there as well. It looks like they're holding rabbits. Um, they were certainly very fond of animals, so I would think that that high, would be highly likely. Um, one of the other big opportunities for recreation on these ships was to be in the band. Um, so this, was, this became quite a professional band. Um, the boys here were booked for lots of different events all around Sydney. They had a tour of country New South Wales for a while as well. Um, they earned the ship a lot of money. And the idea was that anything that they won or were gifted while they were out playing would then go towards buying things that the, everyone on the ship would like. Um, at one point, they saved up enough money for a magic lantern so they could have slides and have talks about different places all over the world. Um, and because they'd all pooled their money for that, that was, again, something that was a really valued item on board. Um, the bandmaster in the middle here, with the amazing moustache, um, he is an ex-Vernon boy who worked on the ship. This is James Burke, um, who was rescued from the streets um, and who became quite a gifted musician um, and ran the Vernon and St. Bronze Band for many decades. I think that that's a great um, testimonial to the work that the staff on these ships um, uh, did. Now, something that James Burke would have been very familiar with is the class system that Captain Eichenstein began and which Mason continued on board. Um, this was probably the best thing that could have happened to these boys because instead of being punished and sometimes flogged by Captain Maine, Nightenstein and Mason tended to reward the boys for good behaviour um, rather than focus on misbehaviour. So James Burke, um, his boys in the Sabron band, he was surrounded by boys who had risen up the classes merely because they were respectful and honest and kind. In class seven, when you arrived on the Vernon and Sabron, you were in class seven, it sucked. No recreation, no privileges whatsoever. You were with all of the really badly behaved children and the new ones. You, it was a very small class, so you could be supervised quite closely. The idea was that new boys who behaved and who respected their peers and their teachers wouldn't be in that class for more than a week before they were moved up to class six. So instantly there's a carrot for these children. In you, if you're in class six, you got to go to, on shore on Sundays to church. Even the ones who weren't particularly interested in church, you still got to go on a boat, you get to land on solid land. You got to walk around Sydney. The band would march you to your church. It would have been great fun. You didn't have to do any of the boring jobs anymore. So class seven were doing things like cleaning bottles, polishing brasswork. You didn't have to do that anymore. You were allowed to be on deck during the recreation hours, whereas Class 7 were down below in the bowels of the ship doing boring jobs. And on holidays and Sundays and Wednesdays and Fridays, you got pudding at meals. Beautiful. I'd be happy with Class 6, but no, there's a Class 5. Class 5, you are completely exempt from any kind of corporal punishment. This was an acknowledgement that you'd been good for quite a while. In addition to all of the privileges from class six, you got to go to the library and you got to go to Cockatoo Island to play. So this is only class five upwards. Class four, we start getting some serious privileges. Um, you got a stripe on your arm. So everyone knew that you were in class four. Absolutely no corporal punishment either. You were paid to be in class four, just a little bit, but you got some pocket money. You were allowed to fish at the gangway. Only 10 boys were in that class, only 10 boys with that stripe. 
Oh, it's like being a prefect, beautiful. Before class three, the stakes are even higher. You've only got six boys in class three. You get double the wage of the class four boys. Class two, there are only three of them. You get a different badge on your arm. My research suggests, because it's not written down anywhere, that it was an anchor. Um, just looking at some of the photographs from the time, you were paid even more. If you were in class one, you were the two top, one of the two top boys, you were paid triple what the class below you was paid. You, oh, you were basically gods. Um, a lot of the boys would aim for these top classes. It was a big deal. If you were in classes three and two and one, you could go into Sydney unsupervised. You were trusted to come back. You got to go and deliver notes from uh, the captains. You were um, written about. You got to do extra jobs. What a great training ground for some of these boys. You would then go out on apprenticeship. I'll speak for about five minutes more about apprenticeship, and then I'm sure people will have questions, even if it's just tell me more about the EMU. <laughs> um, the, the, the last arm, I suppose, of this institution, um, other than going to academic lessons, other than the trade training, other than the recreation, all of these things were heading towards that really important apprenticeship. All these boys went on. Um, ideally, you would be sent out somewhere in New South Wales. The captains preferred not to have city apprentices just because you would be too close to maybe your family, um, perhaps your old gang that you were a part of. The idea was to separate these boys. Now, today, I think we sometimes think that that sounds very cruel, separating children from their parents, but I think we need to remember that these are Victorian minds um, and this sense of separation, um, even if we don't agree with it, was very popular back then. Um, once the captain was satisfied that the boy who was going to be apprenticed would behave, so if you were still in class seven, <laughs> for instance, you're not going out on apprenticeship. So once the boy had been well behaved for a sustained amount of time and there was somewhere where he wanted to go, the boys weren't just farmed out, hey, kid, you never thought of dairy farming, here we go. Um, they would be asked. Um, then they would be moved out to wherever it was. Normally their master would come and collect them, sometimes a delegate, and then they would travel out into the countryside with this child. And a key part of that relationship with, between the boy and the captain was maintained through letter writing. And this is uh, where a lot of my research has focused upon all of these letters coming through from the boys um, as boys and as adults later on in their lives, and then also return letters from the captain. Um, apprentices tended to be um, as general servants. That was the big uh, type of apprenticeship, but also a lot of sailors. Um, also a lot of general farmhands were created from this system. As we're on Cockatoo Island right now, I think that it might be um, timely to mention that under Captain Mason um, on Cockatoo Island, some of the carpentry sheds were reopened um, in the early 1900s. And some of the boys were apprenticed to the Department of Public Work to exclusively make school furniture. Um, and if you, if you know your school furniture, um, you will recognize this stripey pattern um, in the middle of the picture here. Um, this is really characteristic of school furniture at this time. If you're interested in school furniture that the Saborn boys made, um, the Schoolhouse Museum in Ride has some examples that um, certainly date to the same time that Saborn boys were making these things. Um, I might finish um, by talking about one of the famous carpenters um, from the Saborn, um, and this is um, Bernie Kieran, who uh, was, he had a very troubled upbringing. Uh, his father died when he was very young and his mother had several children and this one she couldn't control. And Kieran was, um, you're probably looking at this thinking, oh, memorial concert, this doesn't end well. Um, he was picked up under the Industrial Schools Act. He was brought on board the ship and very quickly he was recognised as someone who was an outstanding swimmer. 
Um, he was in the Sabron Swimming Club, so he rose up the ranks of that class system. Um, and he was apprenticed as one of the carpentry boys. Um, he was an outstanding swimmer by um, the end of his career and he died when he was 19. Um, he held the world records for the 200, 300, 440, 500, 1,000 and 1,760 yards. He held almost the same New South Wales championship title titles um, and almost the same uh, titles for um, the Australasia competition. Um, he competed overseas and then he died suddenly of appendicitis when he was quite young. Um, and this is uh, an invitation to his memorial concert um, where the boys on board um, and the staff uh, look to raise money for his memorial, which still exists today um, at Gore Hill Cemetery in North Sydney. Um, I think this is so characteristic of the Braun boys um, that he won his laurels by courage, self-denial um, and patent effort. His achievements and manly qualities will long be remembered in this and other countries in which his victories were gained. I think that sums up the, uh, the goal for all Sabron boys. I think if we think about the, that first image of the Vernon and how terrifying it looked, um, I think if we delve a little deeper and look at the letters that these boys were writing, look at artefacts like this, we start to understand that actually this ship was not a reformatory. It was not for juvenile criminals. It was for children who were being neglected um, or who just refused to go to school um, and obey rules that their parents set for them. Um, and children like Kieran um, were definitely some who benefited from the system, even if people like John Slay, our bush ranger, and William Rice, our pistol holder, and Tommy Cox, the assaulter of everyone, didn't quite work out, uh, but many of them did. Um, I might, this is the Sabron again, but I might put up an ad for my book. <laughs> Um, we might have questions if anyone has a question. I might ask the people in the room first and then we can see if anyone online has a question. Is anyone in the room? Oh, yes. Thank um, you. You said the parents of the boys, did they get to visit them or did you rent them? Uh, that oh. Yes. So for people at home, um, the question was, could you visit your children? Um, yes, the answer is yes. There were two visiting days a year. Um, before that, it had been a bit confusing. Um, but after about, um, from about 1880, there were two designated visiting days. They were apparently quite the event. Um, there would be lots and lots of families who were there with their other children who weren't on the Vernon. <laughs> I'm sure some boys were thinking, why am I not at home again? Um, uh, and there would be lots of, um, the way it's, the way it was often described in the newspapers, this sort of a carnival atmosphere was occurring. Um, the captain sometimes complained about those days that after the parents had left, you had a lot of boys who would come up to them and say, oh, my mother promised that I'd be off this ship next week, so I'm not going on an apprenticeship. And they would have problems based on that. Um, but it, I think it would be wrong to think that these boys were all orphans um, out on the streets. Sometimes it would just be a case of um, maybe a parent out of work, couldn't afford to support the child and then as a result they were out wandering during the day um, and therefore applicable to be picked up under the Industrial Schools Act. So there was parent contact but I think during the apprenticeship um, phase often they tried to separate parent and child a little bit just so that it could be a success. I think 21st century eyes think oh that's not a success but in this era, it was regarded, I suppose, if you had an 18 year old who had saved a bit of money from their apprenticeship and had skills and a future job prospect, that that was a success. What was the state of life before the dimension of the girls' folks there? What was the state of life after they were similar to before? Yeah, um, so the question for people at home was was the girl? Um, was the girls' institution similar in terms of daily life? Um, the boys had a lot more money spent on them. Uh, you know, you look at a ship 
either the Vernon or Sabron that's docked at Cockatoo Island, it's been entirely refitted. It's an expensive process to keep a ship like that going, whereas the girls are sitting in old convict barracks. So less was spent on the girls. Um, there are horrible stories about girls having to share handkerchiefs between them, um, uh, not being always fed completely well. Um, there was uh, two interesting women um, who came from came from Britain in the 1870s, um, Rosamond and Florence Hill, and they did a tour of a lot of the institutions for children and otherwise uh, in Sydney, and they were quite stunned at the discrepancy between what the Vernon boys were being fed and how they were being treated and how the girls were. Um, they were very disturbed that the girls had no boats to get them off the island for, say, an excursion or even just to go to church. And Rosamond and Florence Hill were very, very conservative Christians. They were very disturbed by that. They saw um, that avenue for saving these girls being entirely cut off and they were worried as a result. So in a sense, it was similar that you were sort of captive in your institution, but the girls were not doing as maybe inventive as tasks as the Vernon and Suborn boys, a lot of sewing and washing and things like that. Up the back. Great question. Um, for people at home, um, we have someone in the audience who's, is it great? Great grandfather was Torres Strait Islander who was on board. Um, and the question is how many other um, Indigenous children were also on board. Um, the entrance books don't delineate um, the racial background um, of these boys. Um, you're provided with information about their name and where they're from. But if it says New South Wales, that could mean anything. Um, even children born overseas, it doesn't help you necessarily. Very few of them were photographed as well. Um, so it's sometimes very difficult to identify children who might be from those minority groups. And it makes it very difficult, therefore, to make a comment about how they were being treated. Um, there is occasionally children who I know were um, Australian Aboriginal because they're called that in newspaper articles when they were being committed to various jails. They would be referred to as Larry, an Aboriginal boy from the Vernon. But when you go and look up their entrance books, you wouldn't have known. So that's an incredibly difficult question to answer. It's a shame in, in, in one sense that it would be wonderful to, for that to be an avenue of analysis. But in another sense, I think it's also quite nice that they weren't being segregated as in the entrance books. Again, what the day-to-day -day life might have been, um, that sort of thing isn't recorded. Um, but yet yeah, not delineated or labelled in the entrance books at all. You might see people online, so I'll sh stop share. Oh, this is not a touch screen. Oh, can I see here? Yeah, oh, no open questions. Okay, oh, that's, oh, 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 yes. Um, the teaching methods seem to be, the later teaching methods seem to be quite innovative. Oh. The reward that kind of thing. Were, was that similar to the rest of the series? In terms of other schools? Yeah. Oh, I think that um, the teachers who worked on the Vernon and Sabron, um, some of them had quite extensive experience in other schools, um, particularly in Sydney. I think that it would be absolutely um, fine to, to make a judgment that they were employing the skills and ideas that they had had in previous jobs. There was always, um, when, when teachers were interviewed for positions on the Vernon and Sabron, there was also always a strong aspect of, will this applicant be able to cope with this kind of boy? Um, the very first teacher on the Vernon in 1867, Henry White, um, he and only one other candidate were interviewed for the job. And Henry White uh, got it just because he had a tiny, a minute amount of experience with children who were uh, educating children who were homeless. Um, it Almost nothing, but it won him the job. 
Um, so I think that a, a lot of those kinds of practices in the classroom maybe would have been um, observable in an ordinary mainstream land-based classroom, but I think things would have been significantly changed for, for the Vernon and Sabron. Um, even just while I'm talking, I think that uh, there was a teacher who was on the Sabron right at the end of its time, and he was very proud in his memoir to say that they never caned boys uh, in the school as had previously happened and which if you look at the punishment books for schools all through New South Wales um, was quite common so they I think they tried some innovative things to uh, maintain attention and things like that um, yeah we'll go one and then two um, is there any mechanism or other areas of this tradition of these from the <laughs> Oh, yes. Yes. So we have to remember that once you were nearing 18 years old, the ship couldn't do anything for you if things went poorly. So William Rice, for instance, who shot that man that day um, out of jealousy, he had been out on an apprenticeship. Things had gone okay. There had been some problems and he was brought back to the ship at one point. The captains never shied away from doing that. Um, but William Rice turned 18. And so it gets to the point where the captain's thinking, well, I, don't, I can't legally do anything here. Um, William Rice uh, fell in with some companions that he'd met on the Vernon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nightmare um, and they robbed a few people and uh, William Rice came into a lot of money and that turned his head a bit so he stopped robbing people he started spending a lot of money and then then he shot that other man but he wore beautiful boots to his <laughs> courtroom <laughs> um, uh, yes that's always remarked upon in the description of him great William um, at the back Yes. So the question is, were the boys paid during apprenticeship? Yes. Um, they were. So if you were a master who's looking for an apprentice, you had to be willing to uh, feed, clothe and shelter the boy um, or the girl. If you were taking a girl, you had to do those things and you couldn't subtract that from their wage. If that was happening, the captain would have to go and knock on your door as they all did. They would just turn up and do a spot check, which if you've seen Captain Nightingale, <laughs> you'd be wanting to do the right thing. Um, paid. The money that they were paid was put into a joint bank account between the boy and the captain, um, and they generally couldn't access that money until they turned 18. The idea was that you had a bit of a nest egg. Some of those boys bought uh, stock if they wanted to continue farming. Um, some of them used it to set up their own business. Um, the very best masters also paid the boys on top of that a little bit of pocket money. Um, and those are the, the, the lovely um, letters that you get um, to the captain saying, you know, um, I'm having a lovely time on my farm. I use my pocket money um, to buy a pig and my, um, my mistress says that when it's fat enough, it can go to market and then I can have the profit bits and then I can buy another pig and if I want I'm allowed to send some money home to my mother. Little lovely heartbreaking lovely stories like that. Um, one boy wrote to the captain saying I'm wondering if it's okay if I use my pocket money even though I don't have to ask you I just, just like your opinion should I buy a pony? <laughs> yes definitely. <laughs> um, we do I think we have we have two questions here. Oh. Oh, is this, are these questions, um, Sarah, what fueled your interest in Vernon and Sabron? Also, why did the school ships stop mooring off copper two? Um, my interest in the Vernon and Sabron, unfortunately, started with Tommy Cox, the boy who attacked everyone. Um, his father, um, this is such a horrible way to get into this topic, and, and I, I feel bad for the, the captains, but this is how it happened. Um, I was researching patients at, at Cowan Park for the Hospital for the Insane. And Tommy Cox's father was there um, and he was very unwell. He suffered from the general paralysis of the insane, um, which meant that he had some really horrific delusions and hallucinations. He was very violent. Um, and his son, uh, I found in a newspaper search, 
was also being considered uh, to be insane. And in this newspaper article I read many years ago, it referred to John Burton Cox's son, Tommy, um, as a Vernon boy. And I thought, oh, I wonder what a Vernon boy is. Um, and that's what got me interested. I thought, oh, brilliant. No one's written a book about this horrific looking ship. I can do that. And for the second part of the question, why did the school ships stop mooring off Copper II? Um, I'm going to reverse that question. Before they got to Cockatoo, the Vernon was um, moved around the harbour near Farm Cove for a little while. Um, and the, a long story short, the location of the ship became a really political concern for a lot of people. Um, the captain, Captain Maine, would be very upset if it was too far near um, one part of the harbour and and you couldn't see the shipping. And then he said none of the boys will want to be sailors. And then he wanted to move it around. And it became a, a really um, con concern for a lot of people. I think that they moved the Vernon and then kept the Suborn at Cockatoo Island, really just so that they could have a place to play um, and also learn some gardening and things like that. Um, and then after 1911, the ship was um, taken over by the Royal Navy and it was moored out near um, Rose Bay and used as a ship to train um, Royal Naval Cadets. There we go. Great questions. Yes, so good. This isn't a touch screen. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. So Thank you, Sarah. I think that was an amazing presentation. I have been around Cockatoo Island for a long time and I, I knew hardly any of that. So I hope that everyone here today felt the same and, and those of you listening at home. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you.